hello everybody that is connected and is online. It's going really tough these uh, months and yeah, we need to survive to this kind of um, strange situations. Today, I would like to, to talk about an experience that we had in the last one, one and a half years. We were building microservice from a legacy system that it was there for, for a few years. Um, first of all, I will introduce a bit more about myself. Um, I'm working as a software engineer, as I said, for Globan, and I also participate in the Scalable Platform Studio where we share our knowledge, where we have kind of um, opportunities to discuss with colleagues that has the same area of expertise. And we also bring new ideas in order to, to try to get more knowledge about cutting neck technologies. Or we also, for example, write articles and, and create some tech toll internally in our company for the same purpose. Um, for me, uh, scalable architecture, distributed system, um, also design new architecture is something that I'm really interested about. And the thing is that I have so many years of experience that they were bringing me opportunities for doing this kind of refactors that I would like to talk uh, today. For the ones that you don't know Globan, I would like to introduce Globan also a bit. It is a company founded in, in Argentina, I think from 2003 or something like that. We, are, uh, we have a lot of office all over the world. And there is one office here in Spain when I'm locating, as I said. And there is also an office in Romania. So hello, everybody from Romania and also the Glovers from there. And as I said, Globan divides the company in areas of expertise. So every employee in the company belongs to one of these uh, areas. We call it the studios. And this is what I was talking about when I was talking for Scalable Platform Studio. So the first thing that I would like to do before we move forward and I deep into the the idea of how to split the, the microservice from a monolithic is to give you a high overview about the project that we were having to, to implement and the area where we were working. Okay, so we are right now, because it, it is not finished yet, we are building the document storage platform for my, my client. Talking about the numbers, it's around 300 millions of document storage right now there, and it's going to be around 300 terabytes of data, more or less. It's a rough estimation because we still will have to do some migration from our system to, to our new system. There is also some expectations for the upcoming year where the, they are trying to understand how the system is gonna grow. Um, for us, the numbers that they were sharing with us is a few millions of documents every year that will come, and this will be increased every year. So you need to have this everything, every of these things into consideration. There is also a challenge here that is a multi-country project. So it's not a project for an Spanish client. It's a client that is launching continuously their, their website into different countries and as soon as they are launching a new a new country we need to be ready to to handle that if we think about what i found when i came into the project i don't know if you have seen this if you have read the article about this monolith i think they were appearing in california in mexico and i think also in a in Romania, in one of the cities that are there. Um, I had some feeling similar to the photographer, to the photographer or the person coming to these places, because the story behind this picture is that there was nothing there. There was something to walk around or to go with your bicycle, but somehow from one day to another, there was a monolith there. That was kind of my feeling. I came into the into my claim. Um, yeah, there was a monolith but there was no team behind the monolith. The team that was there working for a few years already was leaving the, the project and it was something that we have to talk, uh, to take over. 
So there was only one developer trying to understand the code base and there was no real ownership of the, of the code itself. And we also need to understand the infrastructure, how the different environments were, were working. Um, there was no huge discussion about if we should introduce microservice or not. The decision or kind of the decision was already taken. So my client is moving ahead with microservice architecture. It is having a lot of uh, teams inside of their organization and they are moving ahead with microservice in many different areas. So there was no tough discussion about why you should stay with a monolithic or why you should move to a microservice. Do you need to do a mix of them or how you should kind of handle these kind of things? It was kind of a decision already taken. But for sure, when I joined to the project, I also wanted to check if that was a good idea or not. Um, which mic my, uh, microservice should we split from, from this uh, monolithic? So there was one repository with one deployment, normal plants in bamboo, nothing special, I would say. So how we will split the monolithic? What do you think we should do first? Well, the first thing that I would like to do, to be honest, is to check. I don't know if you have seen this picture from Homer Simpson before, but I would like to do a checklist to go forward and to check if I have all of these capabilities. And if I don't have it, let's see how or, or what can I do. The first thing that I think is really important is, is, is infrastructure. So how mature is your infrastructure? Do you have a DevOps culture in your company? Um, not only culture, do you have a DevOps team or is somebody taking these kind of things into their team or is something that you have to do? Um, do you have cloud or a private or a public cloud? Doesn't matter. Are you going to deploy new machines or do you need to buy those machines or are you going to deploy in virtual machines? So these kind of things that looks like okay, maybe they are not a problem because you are already having a monolithic and you can deploy and this kind of stuff. But just imagine that if your monolithic is having problems deploying or having new uh, hardware, you are going to multiply the problem. With the amount of microservice that you will create, this will be the multiplier for your pain in the ass, I would say. So first check if you are operational ready, and then we jump to the second topic. Are we having tests? Are we having automatic tests? How good is the coverage of your monolithic? Because you need to get some feedback when you are in the process of the splitting. So you will need to run your tests against your microservice continuously just to check that everything that you were considering that it should be working in one way, it is working as you are expecting. So in our case, for example, from the infrastructure point of view, we were ready. We were in AWS, the DevOps teams was a good team. So he, they were able to manage new pipelines, new VMs, new infrastructure, new plants in bamboo without any big problem. And this is within a big organization. And from the testing phase, we were not really good, I would say. We were not having automatic tests. I think this is quite important because you are going to have so many small problems divided and you would like to check it. And this will allow you to, to split faster the, the microservice. We didn't have automatic tests, but we had a 60% coverage, EA unit uh, coverage. It was not really good because the quality of the tests were not really good at that point. And we also had a huge Postman collection from where we extracted a few examples through our APIs. We introduced a tester in this point. She was able to take the Postman collection, talk to the stakeholders, getting more knowledge about different use cases, and then implement a huge battery of um, automatic tests. Another thing that I consider that is important is delivery. So are you going to continue working in the old system or are you going to move to the new system? Do you need to 
keep some capacity for the old system, for new features, only for hot fixes. And one question that came to my mind always as a developer is, can we start from scratch? Is there any possibility that if we find something really bad, we will be able to start from scratch? I will say 99% of the cases, your customer will say, no, you cannot start from scratch. And we must continue running our business. That was also our case. So thinking about how you will move forward, I would like to talk about three pillars, three things that I consider key when you are going to split and do the division. The first thing is about code coupling. So you need to understand how the components that the developers were creating in the code base is working, how the relationship between those components is handled. If there is so much coupling, you will have so many problems there. If there is a high cohesion and a low coupling, you will be fine. Your split will be smooth and everything will be nice. If you take a look to the picture, this is coming from Wikipedia. What I mean, what I'm telling with this is that you will have to cut either the red line or either the green lines. If you have, if you need to cut the uh, red line, you will have so many problems. So my recommendation here is that you bring some KPIs. You have to measure somehow the coupling in all of the code base that you have. If you have millions of lines of code, you need to get some feeling. If you get numbers about those, those feelings, it is better. In our case, I was able to get some feelings and also some understanding using different tools. For example, I remember to use Structure 101 or Sonar Cube just to get a feeling about, okay, if I take this component, how the relation with other components it is created. Is there any uh, big couple? It is, a shared comp it is a shared component that when I'm doing the split, I will have to refactor continuously. Is it isolated? There are some things that it doesn't matter if they are um, couple or if they are duplicated when you split the microservice, like for example, DTOs or maybe some utility classes. But when it comes to core components is when you can have more problems because you will copy a lot of code or maybe you are bringing functionality that you really don't know, but it's really complex to, to refactor. Um, one question that you also need to consider here is, can you reuse your code base? This is where the, should we start from a scratch question is coming. In our case, we didn't need to start from scratch. Our code base was coupled, of course. We created a list of the classes that we thought that would be better to refactor or that would be a problem later on, better say that. And um, that was helping us in order to understand, well, when I am starting with the first microservice, everything will be uh, okay. We also detected that the APIs that we were having were giving us a vertical split somehow for the components that we thought or for the domains that we thought it would be better to split in, in microservice. So you have an understanding, you are already thinking about the code. What do you think is next? The next thing that you should consider is the data model. It's kind of the same approach. You need to understand if the models, if all the tables that you have in your database are connected, are really coupled. And when you are thinking about the microservice that you would like to create, how you are going to split the database in different sections in a way that you could copy these tables with the data and put it in a different database. In our case, it was not a big of the deal, but I can imagine that if you are accessing a table and your queries are mixing different tables continuously, so if there is many joins, if there is a select that is doing a filter with another select or things like that, you will have a lot of problems there. I remember to read one, um, one case from GitHub where they were having um, a big couple here 
they were they were having a code base, I think, with some millions of lines of code. And when they were taking a look to the database, there were a couple between the models that they wanted to split. So what they did was to create kind of a parser to rewrite the queries before they were executed into the database. Because the thing here is that if you are not able to divide your database in many different components that will go to your microservice or in the microservice that you are already having in mind, you will need to refactor this before to start with the split. There is no way that you go ahead without to do anything here. In our case, as I said, there was no big problem here. We take a look. There were two databases more or less separated. So the code was doing some search or some sell it to one of the databases. And with the data, they were filtering in another database, in, in, in another database. But there was no joins, no big deal there. The biggest of the problem here for us was that we find out one database that it was belonging to another, um, another product, another proprietary product that it was installed outside of our AWS account and everything from, from outside of our control. And we were reading this data from there without any control of the data model, without any control of how this data model will be um, upgraded or how it will change. So if they change it something, maybe they break us. Um, so that was one of our biggest problems then. So can we do the speed? Not yet. We still need to decide which micro why we are here is we were having a monolith and we now need to, to decide which microservice do we want to create. So we need to identify those microservices that are going to be extracted from our application. So I like to think about microservice domains, like in domain driven design. So you look for different core features. You look for this kind of domains. So you create this microservice domain. I hope that this terminology is good for you. Maybe not, I don't know. But I was looking for this kind of domains, putting names to them, um, how they will interact between each other. I was also talking to the stakeholders in order to get some knowledge about the, the, the features that they're deciding for, for the next upcoming months. If they have a roadmap, they can share to you how they are thinking about how this will grow. You can also talk to the business. I mean, you should get some feeling about how the business is evolving. What are the things that could come later? And in which area are you working on? And of course, you can take a look to the competitors. I usually do it. I mean, when there is some, um, uh, an idea that you have and that you manage really well. Maybe you already have some ideas. You have already uh, read some articles in the past, everything. But for me, in this case, I was not working in any um, storage for documents, never. So I take a look to the competitor. I don't remember exactly if I found good articles about what they were doing because everybody talk about e-commerce. There is so many examples. But for me, it's, it's always a good idea to take a look because I can find out good names. I'm pretty bad putting names to things. So if you go outside, you bring some names, it's not bad at all. And if you are working in e-commerce, go there because there is so many examples. Believe me, there is so many articles. I think there is one from Martin Fowler or somebody working with him that is talking about logistic or um, or stock or something like that. So for us, the names that we found out on the microservice was storage, catalog, and composition. They were having a lot of sense to us and we were seeing how this will grow. When you have this kind of things, something that I was forgetting to tell you, when you have this, this draft of domains, my recommendation is that you do a validation with the stakeholders and with the engineers. 
because if somehow it's not working, you will get some bad feedback and then you can improve the model. Also, I like to think about the future. So design a future on top of the draft that you have already created about the microservice that you want to create. Start to think about how will be the scalability, how will be the new designs that you can create. If that is working, move ahead. If that is not working, I think you should reconsider your microservice and then go around and work a bit more. And okay, so we have analyzed the code. We have analyzed the data model. We have also taken a look to the microservice that we would like to create. Well, now it's time to, to do the split. So if you take a look to the picture, it's kind of showing you a high level architecture. It's a really simplified version of the things that we were able to find there. So there was a monolithic. <clears throat> there were different databases. There were also a database that it was not in our control. There were so many connections to different services that you have to somehow aggregate or handle through your, your API. Um, there were AWS service. Um, what else, what else that I remember? I think that's more or less the high level overview. My recommendation here, and that's what we did, is to start with the simplest microservice that you can. Because it doesn't matter how the analysis went, it doesn't matter how many things you thought it would be good to do or how many coupling you find it, you need to learn from the experience. So the first thing that you can do is to take one of the microservices and extract it from the monolithic. That will bring you a lot of experience about what are you going to find and how you are going to solve some problems. Also, if your measurement of the KPIs and the couplings and those kind of things were not really good, you will learn here if those are working. So what we did was to take a copy of the code base. We were copying completely the code to another repository. And because as I said, the REST API API was kind of dividing a bit vertically the microservice or at least some of them. We took the REST API that it was okay for the first microservice. And then we removed all the other APIs from the copy. So you start having a lot of code that is not used and it, that is not necessary. And then from top to down, you can start removing code that is not neither used or neither call it from another place. Um, here, here, you can use your IDE. It will give you a lot of warnings about the code that you are not using. It doesn't work in all the case, believe me, because you know there is this, this kind of fancy stuff like reflection. Sometimes maybe modularization doesn't show you when your code is in use from another place because you are living in different modules. So you are don't know always when your code is completely not use it or use it. There are funny stuff like if a test is calling your code, your code is in use or your ID will not say that you should delete this part of the code, but that's something simple to manage. The thing is that you start removing this as an iterative process, then you clean up the microservice and you reduce completely the functionality that you wanted to have in your microservice. One advice here is that you shouldn't change any name, any inheritance, compositions. If you don't like the package, leave it there. Create your to-do list, start writing there what you were finding that is not okay. If you can, you can prioritize those kind of tasks for the future. If you cannot, because you don't have time at that point, leave it there. We can talk later about these kind of things that you were finding. But don't change too much. Maybe modules, 
I don't recommend you to do that at the first uh, step or package or these kind of things. Why? As I said, we are still having the old system up and running. So if we need to take one hotfix, one patch from the old system to the new system, it will be hard because maybe you were deleting some things, but it's not going to be a big problem. You still can manage that. You go to one folder, you compare to another folder, you more or less know where the things will go. And then you can do it. Maybe you need to refactor to remove some part because they are not used it anymore. But that's okay. There is no big of the deal there. For example, for us, we detected that the startup of the application was bad, that some auto wire were not really working, some injection from Spring were not good. We also detected some uh, older libraries. We detected that the scripts for the database were not uh, automatically used or automatically handled. So there was no flyway or any other tool and there was no good test coverage, as I said. Some of these things we did it at the beginning because they will go with all the microservice, like problems with the startup of the application. It's like a normal refactor. But some of the other things we didn't implement it until we split the monolithic. For example, flyway. Test coverage was not really increased until we started to delete a lot of code we started to delete a lot of dependencies. So when you have to mock or you have to do some J unit mocking, whatever, it's simplifier. It's the simplest version. Okay. So, oh. so you have already the, the microservice, first one. Now what you should do to move forward with the microservice that you have. The first thing that we did was to test completely the deployment. So with the first version that we were having, we move on to all the different environments just to test that the infrastructure was okay, that every script ca that can run behind the scenes for DevOps or for automatic scaling or for whatever reason, that it was not in our control, it was in the DevOps team control, it was okay. So you know that you will go to production and the software can be used. But there is one big question here. Um, how are you going to, to handle the traffic? How you are going to start using the real microservice? So here we decided, well, we had some discussion about if we should put the service in production and redirect the traffic from one service to another. Um, but the last idea that we had was to use the monolithic as a pass-through proxy so that every request that is coming to the monolithic, it will go directly through the, the first controller layer to the microservice. So your microservice will be responding from the very beginning. Of course, you have to do some refactoring. So you need to remove all the API calls to your microservice, but that was working for us. That was also okay for us. You also have to consider if in the monolithic, you are using the microservice. If you have some kind of um, request, if you have some kind of message or classes that you were using before. So you will have to refactor that part in order to start doing some kind of connections to that. And there is also the data migration. So as I said, for us, the data was not a big of the deal. We did a dump of our database. We just connected, uh, we just copy that data to, to the, our new database and then our microservice can be able to start using that data. But you need to decide when you are going to do the migration, how you are going to migrate the data. Something that is horrible and is not a good practice is that you connect two service, monolithic microservice, it doesn't matter, to the same shared database. We are not moving ahead with microservice if we are sharing the, the database. So you will have to migrate your data. And that's a topic for another discussion, I will say because migrating data is always something tough. It will depend completely about how many data do you have, how much update it will receive, and um, 
how complicated is the data model, how, how connected is with the rest of the things. So the part that is interesting to you, you will migrate to another database. Um, later on, what we did was to deprecate the API, the old API, and ask our clients to move to the new API. It was only a change in the host. There was no change in the contracts or the interfaces or whatever. But you know, you never know when people is deploying. Some people has easy deployment, so they can just change a property, changing the host and everything works. And there are some other people that only deploy one time per month. I don't know, you cannot control that. And they are not moving completely from one day to another. So you will have to keep a period where you are saying, okay, for a month or for three months, I will still give you support. My API will still respond. But after three months, I will cut completely the API that you were using before and then move to the different environments they cut. If your microservice was not really responding to this REST API or whatever, you will have different kind of problems because maybe it is listening message or it is interchanging message. So the approach probably will be different. So now that you are here, what do you think we should do next? Well, the answer is simple. We should move with the next one. We already have one. We learn it a lot. So we try to do the same for the next one. Keep the biggest microservice for the end. Don't move the biggest microservice at the beginning, neither in the middle. Just keep it for the end. As soon as you are removing microservice one after the other, in some point, what you have there is simple. So you can think that the complexity that it was there from the very beginning is kind of being removed somehow magically. Well, not magically, because you are reducing continuously the the software that you are handling. This is kind of the diagram. Our final diagram is also a high level overview of the things that we find. So you can see different domains accessing directly to their own data or one service. Um, if you take a look, there was one microservice. We did the split, it's the yellow one. This one was the microservice that was assessing the data that was not belonging to us. So here we had to do a tough call. We were talking to our upper management within our client. And we said, look, this API is not within our area of, um, it's not within our department. It's not something that we can handle. So if you take a look, the third party service is a product, is a proprietary software. They do upgrade continuously. They don't tell you which chains are going to be in the database. So if they change somehow the model there, the relationship between the tables, we will not be able to, to handle that. So our microservice will have a lot of problems there. So we said to, to them, it is better that the other team take the control. That was tough because you need to convince somebody from outside of your department that they should take care of something that they were not building. But the thing, the, the, the thing here is that this was kind of an API of their product. So, I mean, if you have a proprietary product, you should have an API somehow. The explanation for this API was about permissions, connectivity, because they were running different accounts, different kind of cloud, and they were using some kind of tunneling for connecting the different accounts. But still we said, if we need to handle this, it could be better that the other team handle this kind of API, because if they change the model, they could change the API and there will be no problem there. So if you have something like this, maybe this is bringing you an idea about what you can do. From the point of view of the split, we are finished. Are we completely finished? I wouldn't say that. I mean, I will say that now the fun part is starting. So it's, it's, I will say for every developer, this is the best part. Because now that you have the microservice, they are isolated. They are kind of working 
outside of the big monolith where you were not able to move forward or to do some stuff, you can start thinking about redesigning your system. I mean, everything at the beginning was a REST API, but for sure we were taking a look to some of the, point, the points and we were seeing that some of this call should be a synchronous message. It should be working behind the scenes. So nobody should wait for an answer of an API that is taking longer than a few hundred milliseconds. And in our case, there were APIs that were taking more than 10, 15 seconds. There were a good explanation there, but still it is too much time. So now it's time to think about, okay, how can I improve this? How can I move forward with messaging system? How can I do this kind of things asynchronously? How can I remove part of my REST API? And how can I improve my system? The first iteration that we did, the first evolution of the software was to handle the storage in a different way. Just give me, give me a few seconds to explain you this problem. So the storage system was responsible to store the documents and also responsible to search for documents. Um, the thing is that the microservice that we were handling, it was a REST API that was calling one third party service and a second uh, third party service. And then we were aggregating the response and then we were giving the response with all the results aggregated. We were seeing this as a problem from the very beginning. I mean, I don't think that I have to say too much about this, but the funny thing here is that when we were diving deep into this, somebody, some stakeholder were telling to us, this can grow. I mean, it's not about two service. It can be three or four. So in the future, we are thinking that it can be three, four services storing different type of documents, different type of things. And you will have to do a query to every system. Every product is going to be a proprietary system. So you will not be able to handle some kind of this information. So we redesigned this from, from scratch. We were able to introduce DynamoDB and we were also able to introduce S3 as the storage for the, the documents, for the files itself. We were introducing lambdas here for some events that are happening from S3, some events that are happening from DynamoDB in order that you put a document in the storage system and then behind the scenes there are updates of the status, there is um, validation of the metadata, there is also authentication of documents or things that we need to do for our our case. And that was working pretty pretty well. The good thing here is that the data that was migrated somehow to this storage system was possible to migrate it to us again. So we had to migrate the data to our system. We are still dealing with some of the migrations but that's something from a really legacy system within, within my client. Okay, um, what else? I'm forgetting something. No, I think we are more or less done here. So that's all from my side. Thank you very much for listening. And if you have any question, I will be more than happy to, to answer them. Yes, we have. First of all, congrats for the presentation. I really enjoyed the pace of the presentation. It was, uh, you know, uh, easy to follow, even for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, and as you mentioned, uh, we're done for now, but this is an ongoing story, right? Exactly. So because it's a legacy system, you are not finished at all. We improve it a lot in the testing area in a way that we can move forward easily and we can check that the things that we are redesigning or changing internally are not breaking completely the, the integration because this is a cross project all over the organization. So you need to be careful that you are not breaking continuously the, their APIs. Mm -hmm. And for your specific context, uh, what's on the list in terms of you know the next thing for, for this project? I mean, uh... Because yeah. the journey is never ending. I mean, it's... Uh, exactly. Yeah. So, so, for example, I was talking about the storage catalog and composition. 
The composition part is something that we have in mind to redesign. It is giving not a good uh, response time when you are requesting too many documents there. It is using a, another third party software. So we are thinking how to improve that. We have some ideas to do some more asynchronously part of the composition, but still, I think we have something to improve there. And I can see that as a challenge in the next months. Okay. Yeah, and yeah, um, architectures and also yeah, the entire software systems as a whole need to be continuously evolving. And I very much like where you said, uh, and now the fun begins. Because sometimes we as developers, we want to constantly improve the tech stack. We want to uh, remove technical debt as soon as possible. But uh, sometimes you see that uh, uh, in a legacy systems, you cannot do that. It's not because you don't want to, but things are very tightly coupled. So the fun starts after you uh, exactly. pull things apart. So for and example, if you, think about, if you think about a few good patterns for microservice, now it's time to take a look to them and try to apply them. Because now you have the ownership also of the code that you were not having before, something that is, is horrible when you are trying to get the things up and running. And now that you have a smaller pieces, you come to think, okay, without to break the system from outside, how can I improve it inside? So there is no big deal there because it's my system and nobody is going to see the results, only good results, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're not impacting negatively, let's say, other exactly. parts. Exactly. So for, for, for me, it's been really insightful. And you have to know that uh, although you, we don't see, there is an entire community out there. So what would be your like final thoughts for today, of course, for, for the community? Well, I think microservices are fun. Um, they are cool because they are trending topic from so many years, but you also need to consider, take a look to the picture. So this kind of containers will be your future. You have to decide if you wanted to have it or not. I can see Amazon, Netflix, GitHub, they have huge code base. So they have a lot of developers inside. So this is the way that they should go because it's also facilitating some things. But you have to think that with microservices coming a lot of overhead to your team. So if within a small team, you have so many microservices, it can slow down your process. So microservices are good, but you have to balance if you need to keep some things as a monolithic, do a mix, or if you need to move forward with the microservice because your team is bigger and can scale a lot. Also, Microservice give you a lot of opportunities for scalability. So you have to think if you are in one of these points where scalability is your main goal. So if you think a bit, uh, if you think a bit about the biggest players, they have a lot of scalability issues. So they need to think about complex system because they have complex problems. But think about you. Are you in a complex system or in a easy system or simplified version of the system? Uh, so I lied, it was not the last question. Yes, because uh, there are a couple more questions popping up. One of them is, uh, can you recommend some strategies to extract a microservice from a monolith, having in mind that meanwhile, you also need to release new versions of your uh, systems and monolith? Well, our approach was kind of easy. You take the code and then you extract the functionality. As soon as you have a version kind of working, Maybe your data is not totally accurate, but as soon as you have an API or a message system or something working, whatever is your problem, then you go to the monolithic and start refactoring that. And that could be a big release because there is, um, there, there is one time when you have to decide if you use the old one or the new one. So there is a zero time. And then you said, okay, I'm going to connect with the microservice. For us, the REST API was the entry point. If your entry point is inside of the monolithic, maybe you can't release the microservice and start migrating some calls to the microservice. It's kind of different. If you don't have REST API, you need to think about inside of your code, when are you going to be able? My recommendation is that you never share the database 
but maybe you need to do one small step and then remove completely the database from one side to another. So it depends always on your case. Mm -hmm. Any, yeah, thank you very Should much. Should we take the last question? Or? Yeah, of course. And uh, the last question starts with, thank you very much. So uh, another uh, good feedback. Uh, how many microservices are in the final system? And how do you detect and manage failure in real time if some microservices are down? Well, something that I forget to mention is that we've had also a good monitoring tool. We use App Dynamics here. You can use New Relic or maybe you have Grafana with uh, Grafana behind so um, InfluxDB or whatever. So monitoring is quite important because you need to take a look what is happening and you also need to take into consideration the flow from where the requests are coming from, where they are going and this kind of thing. They also give you response times, average, number of requests that were failing and this kind of thing. So that's important. I forget the, the second part of the question. No, I don't. How do you detect in real time if some microservices are down? Yeah, our monitoring tool will tell you that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Super. Uh, it's, uh, yeah it's what uh, you were also discussing earlier, because there are trade-offs and uh, microservices, uh, microservice architecture brings some advantages, but then also maybe monitoring is uh, more difficult. Uh, so then you need to see if you, uh, I don't know, if you just uh, release everything uh, once per year and uh, you have a small team, uh, maybe, yeah, you would just get the extra overhead and that's it. I mean, I, I learned a long time ago that monitoring is always important. It doesn't matter if you have microservice or if you have a monolithic. You want to know how many requests do you have, how much memory is in use, if the garbage collector is running or not, how many errors do you have, I don't know, how much time is taking some request that you, you have, how the database is going on, if it's uh, getting slower in some part or not, if your servers are down or up. We were also uh, having some information about conversion rates. For example, everything looks cool. Every service is running. But I remember when I was working in an e-commerce for traveling, that when our conversion rate was behind some numbers, my CTO was always nervous looking into the latest release, the latest feature, and he was always right. We were breaking somehow <laughs> some functionalities the code was working, but maybe there was a null pointer or there was an exception that we didn't consider important and it was breaking down our conversion. So monitoring is always important, I would say. All right. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, Jesus, have you experienced, uh, have you experienced uh, the event source systems? Event source systems. I mean, have you any experience in this domain? We... I was using Rabbit and Q for a really long time. Right now, because we are within uh, AWS, we use a lot SNS and SQS. We are using also even Bridge for communicating with external systems because every installation in our client is a different account. And we decided that when we don't know how many um, listeners or how many systems are going to to read our our events, we will use Eventbridge. But internally for us, we use a lot of queues. For example, when we are finishing some jobs, we publish a message to the queue. And then when the other system is ready or has some capacity, is reading from the queue. So if you, in some point the server is down or whatever, as soon as you restart the server or the microservice, you will be able to read all, all the message. Mm -hmm. So we have some messages going on between the different parts. Okay, okay. So 